You got your Bibles open to Isaiah chapter 2? Look at verse number 1, please. Isaiah chapter 2 and verse number 1. The Bible says, The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, and it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and, we, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the sword of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come ye, and let us walk in the light of the Lord. I've been preaching now all year long on the subject of let us. There are 50 passages in the Bible that what we call preachable passages and uh, let us, today is let us number uh, 40, let us part number 40. Now, I know we've only got two more Sundays left, so I'll be preaching five sermons next Sunday and five sermons the Sunday after. But anyway, uh, no, it looks like we're only going to get to 42 out of the 50 before the end of the year. But today, I want to talk to us about let us walk in the light of the Lord. Let us walk in the light of the Lord. Of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here this morning. What a joy it is to be in your house. I'm so grateful that these people have come, and I'm so grateful for you, dear Lord, your presence. And Lord, I, I yield myself to you, Holy Spirit of God. Please fill me with your power. I also pray for the mind of Christ. Help my mind to be alert and to be focused on the sermon, and help every word that I say be exactly what you want. I pray for every person here to have ears to hear, a heart to receive, and a mind to comprehend. If there's any among us that needs to be saved or anybody that needs to be baptized, help them to make those important decisions today. And Father, please uh, bless those watching online, and please do a work that only you can do. We'll give you all the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us walk in the light of the Lord. I cannot express to you how much God cares about you. He wants your life to be great and to be blessed. You know, we live in a society that applauds mediocrity. We live in a society that, 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 that talks down upon those who want to excel, that wants to punish those that succeed. We live in a society where, and there's so much wrong with our public school systems. There's so much wrong. But one of the things that's wrong with our public school systems is that everybody gets a participation trophy and they don't talk about who wins anymore or they don't try to help the students to achieve to win. Uh, that's not biblical, by the way. The Bible tells us everyone runs in a race, all run in a race, but only one receives the prize. And then it says, so run that ye may obtain. What we have lost in our society, in our culture, is developing winners. We've lost those that have developed excellency, trying to be excellent and to strive and to go above and beyond what's average or normal and to try to push yourself to limits and to grow in that regard. Um, uh, the Bible wants us not to just be mediocre. The Bible does, God does not want us just to be average. He wants us to have a great life and he wants us to be blessed and the Bible tells us exactly how that we can do that. The way we do that is to walk in the light of the Lord. The light of the Lord will make your life better. And so I want to I talk to you about that today. I, you know what? Uh, I, I, I say this often, and I hope it doesn't get old for some of you. But, man, life is short. And after being turning 50, I know that I've got less days to live than I've already lived. And I don't want to waste a single day. I don't want one day to be useless. I don't want one week to be bad. I don't want a month to be, well, I, you know, uh, I wasted a whole month or even a year. Every single day of my life is precious to me, 
And I want to make sure every single day counts for God. And I want it to be great, and I want it to be blessed. And, I, and if you want that today, I'm going to help you with that with seven points of how uh, this can help you. Now look at verse number three of Isaiah chapter number two. It says, and many people shall go and say, come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob. Number one, write this down. The light of the Lord shines from God's house. The light of the Lord shines from God's house. Now, listen to me very, very carefully. We live in a culture and we live in a society that believes and tells us you don't have to go to church. If anything else is going on in your world that's more important than church, then go to do that and don't go to church. We live in a culture where they say family first. And what that literally means is don't let church get in the way of your family. And to me, that's so insane to me. That's so weird and, and, and backwards. Um, church doesn't get in the way of your family. Church blesses your family. Uh, church allows you to walk in the light of the Lord. It's at God's house where the light of, God's, uh, the, light of the Lord shines brightly. Uh, the Bible says the church of the living God is the pillar and the ground of the truth. So if you don't participate and have a relationship with the church of the living God, then you do not have the pillar and ground of the truth in your life. And so the Bible is very clear. Now, all throughout the Bible, the house of God was relevant to the people of God. In the Old Testament, the first house of God that was mentioned was what we call the tabernacle. It was a temporary house of God. It was, it was basically a, a tent. And when they wandered through the wilderness on the way to the, the promised land, and then when they got in the promised land, the house of God was the tabernacle. Then Solomon became king, and he erected the temple. And the house of God then became solid, and it was called the temple. Then in the New Testament, when Jesus was uh, a child, before he started his earthly ministry, it was called the synagogue. And the synagogue was the house of God. And then during the earthly ministry of, of Christ, Jesus said, upon this rock, pointing to himself, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against him. And he started the church. And now we live in the church age. So going back all the way to Moses, the first house of God uh, was the tabernacle. Then it was the temple, then it was the synagogue, and then it is now the church, all right? But in every single generation of, of mankind, you know, from the beginning of the house of God till now, the house of God has always been relevant to the people of God. It's just in America that it's not, and it's sad. It needs to be relevant. You need to come to the house of God. You need to be faithful. The Bible says a faithful man shall abound with blessings. Now, in our church, you have five different unique opportunities for you to come to a church service. All right, we have Sunday school. That happens from 930 to 1030. We have the 1045 service Sunday morning. We have Sunday night at 6. We've got Wednesday night at 7. And then for those of you that we have a special service, called Reformers Unanimous. It meets every Friday night. It's a faith-based addictions program. So it's not a normal church service, what we call normal, but what it is is just a special program to help people overcome any addictions that they're struggling with in their life. So you have five unique separate opportunities to go to church if you would like and you ought to come more than not um, some people come one hour a week and believe me i'm glad you're here i don't want anybody not to come at all zero hours a week is is not good at all but if you come more than one then you get more light more blessing more opportunity to grow in the lord and so just so you understand the light of the lord shines from god's house i heard a preacher say this many years ago and i believe it to be true everything Thing that God does he does it through his church by his word everything that God does in other words um, everything that God participates in that he births that he's involved in the kingdom of God is through his church by his word 
And so don't ever forget that. Uh, you need church in your life if you want the light of the Lord. Obviously, you're here now. I'm preaching to the choir. But the fact of the matter is don't ever feel like you outgrow church. Don't ever feel like, hey, I'll stay home tonight and watch Sunday night football instead of coming to church. Uh, that's, not a good, that's not a good thing to do. And uh, Wednesday night, come to church. Uh, it's in the middle of the week. I know, but it's an oasis between Sundays. And it really is worth the effort. It's a blessing to come to church on Wednesday night. So come as much as you can. Why? Because the light of the Lord shines from God's house. Number two, look at verse three again. It says this, and many people shall go. Is somebody here this morning? Can, can I get an amen? All right. Now, if you look, you, you, I hope all of you are not watching the score on the Broncos game. I hope not all of you are doing that right now. Um, I'll tell you what the score is. I got the TV right here. 17 to 3. Broncos are winning. All right. So, uh, but at any rate, uh, no, listen carefully now. Um, um, uh, be here mentally and spiritually as, as well as physically. Amen. God's good. So just say amen. Uh, say, when should I say amen? Well, you can say amen because you agree with something I say, or you can say amen because you're falling asleep and you're trying to keep yourself awake. All right, say amen. All right, here we go. Look at verse 3. And many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways. Number two, write this down. Be teachable. Be teachable. The hardest people... In 25 years of pastoring for me to teach are adults. The hardest. Children and teenagers are so much more prone to accepting instruction. I'm going to tell you why. When you're in kindergarten, let's say you start preschool, K-4, and you go all the way to 12th grade, you're either 17 or 18 when you graduate, you spend, as a child and a teenager, all of your life being taught by teachers being instructed but something happens when we either graduate from high school or graduate from college in our mind something happens we think we're done learning we're done being taught i've learned everything i'm going to learn i got it all down it's all good and now we go into what we call adulthood with the idea I got it all together. And then we come to church and a pastor stands up and he reads the scripture and he preaches and he basically says in the Greek, you don't have it all together. <laughs> and he, but but it's you know, he's teaching the word of God, but but you're learning or you're supposed to be learning. And so often, do you know who comes to churches most of the time when they pick a church to go to? Most of the time Christians go to a church that preaches what they already believe. That's how it usually goes. Mom, dad, or, or honey, I found a church that preaches what we believe. I remember my first experience with this. I was, um, I was uh, uh, in a Lama's class with our first, you know, my wife was pregnant, our first baby. And, um, and she was with child. And uh, there was this couple there that we have got to know at the Lamaz class. And uh, they're good people. They're not bad people at all. But I, I got to meet them. And uh, I told them I was a pastor. And he asked me, what version do you use? And uh, I said, the King James Version. And he whipped around and said, honey, we found a church that uses the King James. And so they came. And they came for about nine months or so, maybe, maybe eight months. But the reason they came was because there was a church that believed like they believed when it came to the King James Bible. However, when I started preaching from the King James Bible, things that they didn't already believe, they were out of here. I'm gone. I'm going to go to a different church. Now, again, they're, and, and, and they're not bad people. I'm not trying to say that people are bad, but I'm just saying people sometimes go to church where they find a church that believes what they already believe, and if the pastor ever tells them something from the Bible that they don't already believe, then usually they leave. They go to a different church, and that's not a good premise. Because if that's how you are, then you'll be a church hopper for the rest of your life, and eventually you're gonna stop going to church because you're not gonna find any church that's perfect. There's not any church that believes exactly like you believe all, all the way through. And so what happens is this. You ought to find a church, and Hopewell is one of them. Uh, you ought to find a church that just simply preaches 
the word of God unconditionally, just 100%, without error, without addition, without, um, uh, without conditions on it. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's 100% the word of God, and that's all it is, right? Because if you want to learn the Bible, then a Bible-believing, Bible-based church is, is right for you. But what happens when you learn the Bible, guess what you happen to learn? You learn sometimes that you're wrong in what you thought, in what you believed. Sometimes you learn there are things you need to believe that you never knew that you needed to believe. So you weren't necessarily believing wrong, like something the opposite of the truth, but you just had not learned what God wanted you to believe, like soul winning or tithing or, or, or just standards and, and all of that stuff. All right? So guess what happens? If you're teachable and the light of the Lord shines from God's house, you'll receive it. If you're not teachable, you'll get mad. You'll get offended, and you'll end up leaving. Again, being a church hopper, or eventually just stop going to church altogether because you can't find a church that believes 100% like you do. And uh, what happens with that, though, the problem with that is, is you become God. You establish in your mind and in your heart what is truth and what you believe instead of letting him establish it. But what you need to do is let him establish it. When he shines light and tells you this is how, uh, this is truth, you're supposed to embrace it. You're supposed to receive it. You're supposed to do it. So I said, number one, the light of the Lord shines from God's house. Number two, be teachable. In other words, don't have a heart of pride. Let the Holy Spirit instruct you. Let the word of God fix you. Sometimes people say, for example, when it comes to alcohol, it's okay to drink as long as you don't get drunk. There's no verse in the Bible that says that. But if you think it's okay to drink as long as you don't get drunk, then you're going to get offended when I say something like that. And some of you might have just got offended right now. But the fact of the Bible, the fact of the matter is, the Bible says, look not upon the wine when it's red. God says, don't even look at alcohol. So that doesn't mean put blindfolds on and then drink. <laughs> doesn't mean that. <laughs> doesn't mean that at all. All right? But the fact of the matter is, is if you would allow yourself to be taught, and if you would be teachable, then you can look at something like that and go, wow, I was wrong. I, I thought it was okay. I thought the only thing the Bible had to say about alcohol was don't get drunk. I mean, almost every Christian I could say would say you're not supposed to get drunk. But, 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 but that's, not, that's just simply not all that God has to say about it. All right, number one, the light of the Lord shines from God's. By the way, get offended at alcohol. I'm going to go to my grave saying alcohol is the, the devil of the poison. Please don't get mad at me. Get mad at me if you want to. It is the devil's poison. And you shouldn't have it in your life, man. You just shouldn't. All right, number two, be teachable. Number three, now look at verse three again. Look at verse three. It says, and many people shall go and come. Let us go up into the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach, of, uh, teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. Look down at verse five. O house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk in the light of the Lord. Number three, write this down. Walk in the light. Walk in the light. The light, that means this, live differently than those in the world. Um, turn over to Ephesians chapter 5. I want you to see this now. Ephesians chapter number 5. By the way, your preacher loves you. Do you know every time I preach the truth, I take a risk? Do you know what that risk is? I risk offending you. But you know what the greater risk is? If I don't preach the truth, is that God won't show up next Sunday. And I want God to show up every time I preach. If I preach the truth, he'll show up. Not every person will, though, because some people get offended at the truth. But if I don't preach the truth, maybe people will show up, but God won't. I'm going to tell you something right now. We have never known a church service in 25 years of Hopewell Baptist Church that God didn't show up. And I don't ever want to find that out. I don't ever want to have a service that God don't show up. All right? Ephesians chapter 5, look down at verse number 8. For ye were sometimes darkness... But now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Okay, so the Bible is crystal clear. The world is in darkness, and when you get saved, you become children of light. You know what God says? You have a choice now. Walk in the darkness of this world or walk as children of light. Now, here's what this means. If you are saved and on your way to heaven, would you please live like it? That's what God says. If you're saved and on your way to heaven, live like it. You should not live like those that are in the darkness of this world. Not that you don't love them. Not that you think you're better than them. It has nothing to do with that. 
But God says you were sometimes darkness. Stop living like you're still in the darkness. You're on your way to heaven. Walk in the light of the Lord. Let your life be different. Um, often I've said something like this. If you were going to court and you were charged with a crime of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? And by the way, coming to one hour of a church service a week is not enough evidence to convict you as being a Christian. You should know there's a lot of people that go to church in America who are not really Christians, right? Amen? There's a lot of people who are not, okay? But you ought to live your life in such a way that if you were ever charged with the crime of being a Christian, there'd be enough evidence to convict you. Okay, let me give you another, let me give you another thought. Something to think about. Ready? If you work a secular job, chances are you work around people who don't go to church and people who are not saved. Amen? So let's suppose on Monday you go to work and you invite your co-worker to church next Sunday because next Sunday is our Christmas service, December 22nd, and you want to invite them to come to our Christmas service. So you go to them and you say, hey, um, let's just say Joe is your co-worker. Hey, Joe, um, here's, a, here's an invitation to Hopewell Baptist Church. Uh, we're having a big Christmas service next Sunday at, on Sunday at 1045 um, on Sunday, December 22nd. I'd like you to come. Now, wait a second. If you did that, how would they respond? Would they look at you and go, <laughs> what's going on? Is, there, is this candid camera? Is, it, is there a photo? Are you joking? What? What do you mean? You go to church? Come on, man. Where's the punchline? If they respond like that, something's wrong. If, they, if, if you invite them to church and they go, oh, man, I know you go to church. I've been watching you for a while. You, 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 you're different. You don't, you don't tell dirty jokes. You don't, you know, cuss. You don't, you know, whatever. And uh, I could tell you're, you're different. I knew you were going to church. And, and uh, now I finally know which church it is, you know. I mean, how would they respond? If, if you invited someone who knew you well to church, would they think you're pulling their leg? Or would they say, you know, I know you're a Christian. How? Not because you preach it, but because your life, you, you show it. You, you live like a Christian. You act like a Christian. You dress, you talk, you behave like a Christian. And that matters to God. All right? So God says, walk in the light. Live differently. Once you get shown the light, once you get told what the light is, live in it. Walk in it. So I said, number one, the light of the Lord shines from God's house. Number two, be teachable. Number three, walk in that light. Number four, look at Psalms chapter four. Now we're going to spend four points. We've got four points left because it's only seven. And we're going to talk about from the book of Psalms, just four different passages, Psalms chapter four. We're going to start reading in verse number three. Y'all still glad to be here this morning? Y'all are quiet this morning. Don't be quiet now. Say amen. W women, if your husbands won't say amen, you start saying amen. Amen. <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh, God is good. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And uh, here we go. Psalm chapter number four. And uh, look down at verse number three. Psalm chapter four and verse number three. Look what it says. Now watch this. But know that the Lord hath set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. Stand in awe. And sin not, commune with your own heart upon your bed, and be still. Selah, offer the sacrifices of righteousness, and put your trust in the Lord. There may be, uh, there be many that say, who will show us any good? Lord, lift thou up the light of thy countenance upon us. Number four, write this down. Stay close to God in order to get more light. Stay close to God in order to get more light. Now, listen to me very carefully. Now, man, okay, okay are, we, are we being teachable right now? Okay, so let's be teachable. Ready? Look what it says in verse 3. But know that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. Okay, here's what this means. All eight plus billion people in planet Earth right now. Are you listening to me? Over eight billion people in planet Earth. Here's what God does those on planet earth who are godly god takes them out and he sets them apart for himself to have a close relationship with him and when god takes those who are godly and sets them apart for himself it says in verse six lord lift thou up the light of thy countenance 
upon us. God says, I will shine my countenance upon those who are godly that I have set apart for myself. What does it mean to be godly? Let me just give you some basic thoughts. To be godly is kind of like this. What would Jesus do, are you listening, if he were in my shoes? What would Jesus do? And you always try to do what Jesus would do. To be godly means to share the same heart as God. One of the greatest men of faith in the Bible was King David. Do you remember what it said about King David? It said he was a man after God's own heart. You know what that meant? That meant David spent his life chasing after the heart of God. That simply meant he wanted to love what God loved. You know what God loves? God loves souls being saved. You know what God loves? He loves his church. He loves the kingdom of God, the things of God. And in order for you to be godly, you've got to have a heart after God. You chase after what God, God's heart is. And you, you want to love the things that God loves. You know, when people go to a church like this, and they're bored out of their mind, or they're like counting the minutes when the preacher's going to get done, or, you know, they're like, I'm only going to be here just this one time, and I can't, <laughs> I'm out of here once as soon as the door's, you know, uh, service is over. You know, I mean, or, or when we have an invitation, and people are getting saved, and people are getting baptized, do you in your heart rejoice over that? You know, the Bible says there's joy in the presence of the angels over one sinner that repenteth. You know, that joy in the presence of the angels is Jesus having a fit running up and down the streets of glory, shouting and, and praising his own name. It's not the angels shouting, it's Jesus shouting. So when we have an invitation and people are getting saved and people are getting baptized, is that in our heart? Do we have joy in our heart? I mean, honestly, I, I know some people have come to our church and, and uh, for years they'll leave during the invitation and not ever watch someone getting baptized. And, and that's, I mean, if you have to go to work, I understand. I mean, if you're here and as soon as service is over, you got to go to work. That's one thing. But if you just want to get out, that's, that's totally different. I mean, seeing someone get saved and baptized is wonderful. And that's part of the heart of God. All right? So God says, if you are godly, he'll set you apart for himself, and you'll be close to him, and he'll shine his light upon you. So I wrote down point number four, stay close to God in order to get more light. I'm going to tell you this right now. There is a real benefit to being godly. There really is. Oh, you get to be closer to God. You get to have his countenance, the light of his countenance shine upon you. It's a wonderful way to live. Don't feel sorry for me. I, I try my best to live godly. I'm not miserable. I'm not. I am happy to have the countenance of God's light shine upon me. All right, I said, uh, number four, stay close to God in order to get more light. Number five, look at Psalm 13, verse 3. Psalm 13. Psalm chapter 13 and verse number three. Psalm 13 and verse three. Look what it says. Consider and hear me, O Lord, my God. Lighten mine eyes lest I sleep the sleep of death. Number five, write this down. God's light will keep you from wasting your life. That's called the sleep of death. God's life, light will keep you from wasting your life. Um, you know what's sad? The average Christian in America wastes his, his and hers life. I mean, listen, if all you do is live for the pursuit of money, you're wasting your life. If all you do is live for things possessions there's a verse in the bible that says a man's life consisteth not of the abundance of the things he possesseth so if your toys in your house and cars and tvs and just whatever your possessions is what you live for that's not what life consists of laying up treasures in heaven living for eternity living with heaven in mind and, um, and living for God. I mean, those are all things that make life worth living. Now, listen to me very carefully. What happens if you walk in darkness? If you walk in darkness, you sleep the sleep of death. Um, I, I have learned over the years, um, it's not good to walk around my house in darkness. I have broken so many toes over the years. 
It's miserable. I mean, it really is. I was walking down the steps the other day. It was a Sunday morning. I think it was 530 in the morning. I, and and it's, it's so hard to, to, to be like completely alert uh, <laughs> that early in the morning. And, I, and I'm walking down the steps and I thought I'd stepped on the last step of my staircase. And I did not. There was one more step. And, but I thought I was on the, on, the, on the floor. And then I went to step, and I didn't realize it was going to be a, another step. And, boy, I face-planted right down to the front. I hurt my knee. I hurt my elbow. My glasses came off of my head. I think I hit the wall with my head. And uh, it was miserable. Do you know why I did that? Because I had the, the lights off. There were no lights on in the staircase. And I was trying to walk down without seeing. I have I've found every single bed leg in my bedroom with my toes at night um it's 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 incredible when when you walk in darkness you stumble you fall you get hurt but it would all be different if you just shined a light do you know what the average christian does he's walking around in spiritual darkness and that's why they stumble they fall they get hurt because they're not walking in the light of the lord you know, I, I have a theory. You want to hear my theory? I believe the average uh, Christian lives like a zombie lives. Um, we have um, a generation of people who are crazed with zombies. I mean, in the last 10, 15 years, what zombies are like, it's the craze. My theory, and I believe this to be true, the reason that we have such a fascination with zombies is because of all the babies we've aborted since Roe versus Wade. And I believe that it's, it's the, the, the children that we have murdered through abortions that is coming back to haunt us. And people are embracing it, the zombies. And that's sad. I, I, I mean, it's just so sad. But I, I feel like zombies are, it's, it's like a representation of the guilt that we have because of all the babies all the millions of babies that have been aborted since Roe versus Way became law. But I'm going to tell you this right now. Spiritually speaking, there's a whole bunch of Christians that are walking around like zombies. The Bible tells us, she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. That's talking about the adulterous woman. She lives in the pleasures of the sins of this world, but she's dead on the inside. And God tells us that. What's going to help me not to waste my life? Can you imagine? Watch this. When you stand before the Lord, when your life is over, I don't want this to happen to you, but the average Christian, when he stands before Jesus on his judgment day, is going to look back on his life with regret, with so many wasted years. Don't let that happen to you. About 15 years ago, there was a gentleman in our church he got saved at the age of 49. And he was celebrating his 50th birthday. He had his 50th birthday and he came to church. I think it was a Sunday night. And he came to me and said, Pastor, I need to talk to you. We went back in the, in the cry room. And um, he was sitting down and I was sitting down with him. And he took his head and he put it in his, head, his hands just like that. And he goes, Pastor, I, I am beside myself. I said, brother, and I, I called his name. I said, what's, what's wrong? He goes, I have just been acutely aware i turned 50 today and i have wasted 50 years of my life i didn't get saved until six months ago and he said i have wasted 50 years of life he said what do i do and i looked at him and i said make the next 50 years count and he lifted up his head and he said, I can do that. You know, if you have any wasted years, you cannot go back and relive them. You can't. But you know what you could do? You could make every day, every week, every month, every year from now count. You really can. Don't sleep the sleep of death. Let God lighten your life, lighten your eyes so that you can be awake spiritually and you can know what's important and know what's valuable. Invest in the kingdom of God because one day you will stand before Jesus and you don't want to stand before him living like a Christian zombie. You want to make your life count. Number six, look at Psalm 27, verse 1. We're almost done. Psalm chapter 27, 
Look down at verse number one. Psalm 27. I like this verse. Psalm chapter 27. In verse number one, it says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Number, number six, write this down. You will not live in fear in God's light. You will not live in fear in God's light. You know what fear does? Fear cripples you. It paralyzes you. The Bible says God has not given us the spirit of fear but of love and of uh, uh, but, but of but of love and of a sound mind and of power but of love and of power and of a sound mind all right so god says i didn't give you the spirit of fear the person who gives you the spirit of fear is the devil if you live your life afraid of the future afraid of what's going to happen if you do what god wants you to do f f afraid of failure if you live your life in fear that's not how god intended god wanted you to live your life in the light of the Lord. And if you live your life in the light of the Lord, you're not going to be afraid of what anything is going to happen. Now, I, I'm acutely aware that the Bible says, all that live godly in, in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If I live like God wants me to live, I'm going to be persecuted. But I don't have to be afraid of it. I don't have to live my life in fear. You know, when I first ran for office, a bunch of people came to me, politicians and political activists, and they pressured me to drop out of the race. And I did. And, and they, they were trying to make me afraid of what was going to happen if I stayed in, 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 as a candidate for House District 63. And for eight weeks, I just I couldn't sleep. I didn't have rest in my soul. I knew that God wanted me to run. And I, and I backed away. And I quit. And I backed down from a fight. And I, that's just not who I am. And so on November 20th, I put out a video. And, um, and, and I said, I'm back in the race. And I'm going to run. And you know what? I'm not afraid. Now, those same threats and those same attacks are still out there, and it's going to happen. I know it's going to happen, but I'm in the light of the Lord. I'm not afraid. I'm not looking forward to the lies. I'm not looking forward to the attacks, but I don't have to fear them because I'm in the light of the Lord. You know, I've had church members leave this church because I, I'm running for office. More than one. The pastor shouldn't run for office or they're liberals and I'm a conservative so they're they're mad at me because I'm not running for their party so I'm a bad person you know and they're not coming back anymore and I really feel bad about that I'm sorry that you know people that I've led to the Lord people been a part of our church for years have quit this church because I'm a politician but you know what or because I'm a candidate I'm sorry I'm not even a politician yet. I'm running for office but you know what I cannot be afraid of what people think of me if I'm doing what God wants me to do now I've never kicked anybody out of this church who was not the same political affiliation that I am I've never done that but it's amazing how people will leave because the pastor's not their political affiliation. It's sad. But I'm just, I'm not afraid. Let the chips fall where they may. I'm going to walk in the light of the Lord, and I'm going to do what God wants. Now, I don't, I don't want battles. I don't want problems. I don't want people to be mad at me. I don't want people to quit the church. I'm not desiring that. But if it happens, I'm not going to be afraid. I'm not going to be afraid. And that's how you can live. You can live your life in the light of the Lord. And guess what? You don't have to be afraid. Don't be afraid of what people think about you. Don't be afraid of the devil's attacks. Sometimes people start living for God and the devil starts to attack them and they get afraid and they stop living for God because the devil fights them. Do you know who's more powerful than the devil? Jesus is. Don't be afraid. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. God says you don't have to be afraid of Satan as long as you walk in the light of the Lord. Number seven and last, look at Psalm 89 and verse 15. Y'all still with me? All right, Psalm 89, verse 15. This will be the last verse that we look at. Psalm 89, verse 15. People are funny, the, the reasons they leave a church. You know, if, if God left the church, then go ahead and leave the church. But if God brought you here, you know, what, do you, you, <laughs> do you think there would never be a disagreement with you and the pastor? <laughs> right i mean come on you think you'd, you'd go to a church and you never have a problem with another church member i mean come on i mean really if god brought you here just stay just stick it out i've been here for 25 and a half years this is year number 26 
and uh, I ain't leaving unless God calls me home or unless the Lord, I mean, obviously if the Lord told, told me to, I would, but I mean, I'm, I'm surrendered to him. But, but you know, it's funny, uh, 25 years and, and, and four months, I've been pastoring, September, October, November, yeah, four months, I've been pastoring this church, and you know what? Not one pulpit committee has ever called me and asked me to consider candidating for their church. Not one. I'm not looking. I'm not going around looking. Does anybody need a church? Anybody need a, uh, I mean, anybody, any church need a pastor? Anybody need a church? Any church need a pastor? I'm, I'm available. I don't do that. If God ever wanted me to leave, he definitely would tell me. But you know what? It's funny. God hadn't told me that. You know, most people, the average Christian, are looking for ways, to, reasons to leave. Don't be that kind of Christian. You just say, Lord, I'm here unless you, you tell me otherwise. And make sure it's from him. It has to be from the Bible. Amen. All right. Psalm 89. Look at verse 15. Blessed is the people that know the joyful sound. They shall walk, O Lord, in the light of thy countenance. Number seven and last, write this down. You'll be happier in God's light. You'll be happier in God's light. Don't feel sorry for me. Don't feel sorry for Mrs. Sulian being married to a pastor. Don't be sorry for my five children who have been raised in a pastor's home. Don't be sorry. That's the, most that's the greatest opportunity for the joyful sound, is walking in the light of the Lord. You know, the most miserable person in this world is not an unsaved person that's going to hell. The most miserable person in this world is a person who's saved and on his way to heaven who's walking in the darkness of this world. The happiest life that you'll ever live is right smack dab in the center of the will of God for your life. If you walk in the light of the Lord, you'll know the joyful sound. I mean, you just really will. Look, I, I'm not going to ask every one of you to say anything, but, but every one of you knows the times that you got backslidden. Every one of you knows those times. And you remember how miserable you were? How unhappy you were? The devil lied to you. He told you to leave church and to stop living for God and your life would be better. And all you found was regret, remorse, guilt, misery, pain. And then when you came back, guess what you found again? Like David said after he committed adultery, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. When David was living in adultery and trying to cover it up with murder, you know what he lost? Not his salvation. He lost his joy. And when he came back to God and got right with the Lord, he got joy. His joy was restored. And that's what happens when you leave the light of the Lord, you lose your joy. But when you come back to the light, that joy comes back again. And that's what you need to do. You'll be happier in God's light. These seven things, the light of the Lord shines from God's house. Be teachable. Walk in the light. Live differently. Stay close to God in order to get more light. God's light will keep you from wasting your life. You will not live in fear in God's light, and you'll be happier in God's light. Let us walk in the light of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here this morning. Oh, God, what a blessing it is to be in your house. And I thank you, Father, for every person that took time in their schedule to come to church. They didn't have to come. But they chose to. They wanted to come. And I pray you bless them for it. Thank you for our guests, those who are here for the first time. Thank you for those who are so faithful, who come every single week. Lord, thank you. I love them. I love them. I love you, Lord, with all of my heart. Sometimes people come to this church and they feel like if there's a disagreement, that, that means we don't love each other. And that's simply not true. I accept every person in this church who wants to be in this church with all the disagreements that, that we may have. And I don't ever want to throw anybody away. I hope they feel the same way. And Lord, I just pray you'd help us all to walk in your light. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed.